So what we're going to do um, this afternoon is we're going to define human factors and we're going to think together and consider why it's so important in maternity care. We're going to meet the dirty dozen. If you've not met them before, then you must be very excited about that. Um, although I'm sure many of you have met them now because you'll have seen them hopefully as you've started to go through your faecal safety modules. But what I really want to do this afternoon is think about how using them can really assist you and your colleagues and then think about how you can contribute when you're participating in face-to-face -face team training in faecal safety. So thinking how you can really bring it to life yourselves because this is not about what specifically about what I or your facilitates present to you. It's really about getting the thought process going and getting you to think about how you can help to take that forward in your own workplace really. So what is human factors? So if we think about what is a definition, people will ask me that. So it is a scientific discipline and it's the scientific discipline that's concerned with the understanding of the interactions among humans and other elements of a system. And that comes from the International Ergonomics Association. But basically, when it comes down, it's the science of people at work. And I really like the definition that World Health Organization um, have. They describe it as the study of all the factors that make it easier to do work in the right way. And if you think right now, what sort of things actually make it easier for you to do your work correctly or in that most optimum way, then it start, Then that's what is really important about it. So this slide is just to remind us and just to let us think about every single day as we get up. It's a nice picture of an early morning sunrise. What we always need to remember is that we're all human. Um, but what's really important about that is to remember that as humans, we are the greatest, you know, the greatest strength in healthcare. So humans are the greatest source of strength in healthcare, and we need to really remember that. But as part of being humans, what comes with that is we have to remember that none of us are infallible. And that does not mean that that's necessarily a weakness in us. We, it's just what's important is that we recognize that. And that doesn't matter how many years we've been trained. It doesn't matter what position we hold, whether, you know, we hold a chief executive position or we have a, you know, a senior midwife position or we have you know, or we're fresh and we're a junior midwife, or you know, none of that makes us infallible. So what's really also quite fascinating is that I think it's, when you think about it, a lot of people have this perception that when you're at home, we'll make mistakes and we're not as harsh on ourselves. Equally, at the same time, we can understand that because if we make mistakes at home, then that doesn't matter to, um, to any of us, that um, we make mistakes at home, then we understand that, we kind of accept that and realize that that um, just happens. But when we go to work and we walk through the door, for some reason, we just, um, you know, we think that, okay, we can't make mistakes. And I'm not saying that it's okay to make mistakes at work, but what we need to do is to have that acceptance and put things in place. So you can see straight away, I made a mistake. My phone wasn't switched off then. Um, and, you know, because we're human, you can prepare and then we get distracted. And we're going to explore that just a little bit deeper this afternoon. So I'm going to get you to do a little bit of an exercise. And I want you to, um, in the chat box, um, just or just to read out to yourself out loud what that says to you. And then I'm going to put the same um, statement up in the top box and the third box um, at the side. And just wondering what everybody reads that as being. Um, if, if you, um, most people, if they read this, they will see that it says a bird in the hand. When you read it again, you realize that actually it says a bird in the, the hand. How many people, is there, you know, anybody want to just come off mute and let me know? Is there anybody that's with it, you know, that, um, that read it any differently? Or did most people, I don't know, Teresa, what's in the chat box, but would, you know, are people like pretty happy that if you read that, it, it, that's what it comes out as? 
Yeah, Maria, um, some people read the, the two these and other people only saw the one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So the thing that we have to remember as well is you're on a human factor session, so you know that I'm going to put things. If you weren't expecting to see that, then you're much less likely um, to come across it. The next exercise that I want you to look at is this. So if you were asked to look at um, these lines quickly and tell me which is the longest line, is it between A or is it between B? Most people would recognize that and they would look in and they would see it and think that it is B, when actually they're absolutely identical. So it's really important that we think about that and we just acknowledge. So most people not knowing would think straight away that it's B. Another one, what do you notice about this? Is this moving on anybody's screen? And I'm guessing that's moving on most people's screen because this optical illusion is just how it works. So that's just how it impacts um, on, you know, that's how it impacts on your mind. So you will think that it's moving when in fact it's actually, as you'll realize, it's just a still pattern. So how does this, how does this read to you? I'm going to read it out loud because we're not in an area where I can ask anybody to read it. But if I read this really quickly, it'll say, according to a research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter, last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. And you'll think, well, how can you do that? But that's because uh, system one, the part of our brain um, just goes into recognizing those patterns and so it will just untangle it because it's working on that pattern recognition so they're familiar words that you're used to saying and so it will unscramble it and it's important that we have that um, that part because that enables us to think um, quickly um, and we're just going to tell you a little bit of a story um, now, if you, for those of you that may have seen it, then um, just bear with me. But this is what actually happened to me one day. Um, so I attended work and was ready for my lunch break and got, went to the fridge to get my lunch and I got no lunch. So that day I had no lunch and I know you're all feeling really sad and sorry for me now. Um, but I'm going to tell you how that actually happened. Um, so I actually did start to prepare this beautiful wrap that you'll see on my screen now. Um, with all those beautiful fillings so it's all very tempting um, but I was racing I'd got to get out the door for 10:15, um, so I needed to be on the road because I'd got a meeting so I needed to find some um, glad wrap to wrap it up um, but I didn't have any it had all gone it had all gone so what did I do I got a grey bag out the kitchen cupboard I think, um, I don't know if many of you used to store those when we used to get them, many of them from Woolies or Coles before they took them away. Um, I used to often have a big bag of them and so the wrap just got put into a clean one of those so that I could just take it to work and get out the door and on the way out I'll just um, pick up my bags, I'm going to drop off the rubbish and I'm going to get into my car. So I do all of that and I get to work, lunchtime, go for my sandwich, my wrap, and I don't have it, where is it gone? So where is it gone? It went in the bin. So this might not be the wrap. And the reason it went in the bin, if you work it back, is because my brain told me that that's where it goes because I'd put it in one of these that are typically a rubbish bag. And so our brains and systems, so it just shows, that, you know, so all of us, I'm sure you can all think of errors that you've made that are similar to these and you'll make them on a daily basis and really it didn't matter too much I was a bit gutted I didn't have my wrap but nothing happened you know there was no adverse outcome as a result other than I was a bit hungry um, different situations in our in our work it can be differently now it wouldn't have mattered I didn't want to forget the wrap that day I didn't want to put the wrap in the bin um, and if somebody told me make sure you don't put the wrap in the bit it wouldn't have really helped the situation what it was was I was distracted I was under pressure I was racing against the clock and I also did something that um, was out of you know I put I put it into a bag that my brain would recognize as being a bag that's meant to go in the rubbish that's how our, our human um, mind will work so if we think about all of that how can understanding human factors then help us at work so if we think about how it can help 
what it can do is that if we use some principles, they, it can actually enhance patient safety and clinical quality. And very importantly, it can also work to support healthcare personnel and optimize our well-being. We need to look at it all together. So if we really start to understand and apply a human factors approach in maternity settings, then that can actually enhance the way that we deliver care and that it's received. So it can enhance safety, reduce error, enhance personal well-being and perform efficiently just by starting to really understand and think differently. And so that's why it's so important that we think about it. So if you've done any of the modules, you'll have seen the human factors um, sign to just try and prompt you. We hope as well that that starts to prompt you and that you can maybe use that in the workplace to just remind each other and think of other ways that you can check in as a team. But you will have definitely seen it throughout the fetal safety modules. What we're going to also do when we think, so we've talked about that and we're aware that we can make errors. So we've said already that we're all capable of making errors. Just to define that, what we mean by an error, it's that consequence of humans being involved which causes a deviation from either an individual's or an organizational intentions or expectations. So it's not what we intended or expected to happen. It has to involve a human and it just, by doing that, causes that deviation um, so that it's not what we thought. If we're gonna take a human factors approach, then we need to consider how and why a threat or an error occurred in the first place. And we need to think about how threats and errors can be identified, reduced or managed. So we've got to explore that. People sometimes say to me, so what's the difference between a threat and an error? Um, one example I can give you is that if you're looking after a woman and she's got an, an allergy to penicillin, then that's clearly a threat. If we actually administer her penicillin, then that's when the error's taken place. So we can't do anything about the threat but we need to plan for that. And then we also need to put strategies in to avoid the error. And then we also have strategies in, in case the error still occurs. So then we have procedures, we have our rapid response teams, and we have our guidance for how we deal with those sort of situations. So that's where we're gonna try and focus on. Because if we're to really maintain an awareness of everything that's happening around us, then we need to be able to notice. We need to be able to notice those potentials for error. And we also need to understand them, not only ourselves, but as a team. And then together we can start to plan ahead. And if at the end of this session, you can come away with thinking about one sentence or one thing that you may do differently in terms of thinking about human involvement, then hopefully that will um, escalate and get you thinking more and you know even if it just makes a difference in one situation then that will be worth it um, so I'm going to finally introduce you to the dirty dozen um, some of you um, may recognize this dirty dozen um, they're not actually our dirty dozen for this afternoon but I always like to put them in they always um, kind of get it into context I'm sure they contributed to many things not going quite right um, uh, although I'm not quite sure they were the total definition of error because at times there would have been intention but they're not our dirty dozen for today the dirty dozen that we're going to look at is a concept developed by Gordon DuPont and Gordon DuPont actually described elements that can act as precursors to accidents or incidents or things that influence people to make mistakes so if we go back and think about if we need to notice so that we can plan ahead, then it would be helpful if we got a, a tool that we could look at. So what we're gonna do is think about ways that we can identify risks or hotspots in your area of work. Um, but then very importantly, whilst we're gonna explore that today, this all comes down to yourselves because we can give examples and we can think of examples today, but they're just examples. What really matters is how you start to think about where those risks or hotspots are in your area of work, what things might impact on you, where you work, and then what you can discuss with your team and when you do that, whether that's at handovers, huddles, how you actually plan strategies. And this is um, a concept that's also been used in aviation, in airline industries, and they'll use it as 
checkpoints at the start of um, a new day with a new team. They'll have a look and they'll use Dirty Dozen um, in some areas to think about what's going to affect them today. So this is our Dirty Dozen, maybe not as interesting at first glance, um, but these are the things um, that we're going to explore in a bit more depth and the things that I want um, you to think about. So thinking about what might affect you in your work and straight away I'm sure that you're looking at these and nodding your heads and ticking and thinking yep I can see those. Um, some of them are more acknowledged than others, some we talk about more. We talk a lot about lack of communication. We don't really discuss as much around the effects of fatigue. So there are some things that um, we make more of an assumption that we should um, deal with um, and some are not as openly discussed. What we want to do is to explore all of um, these areas. Um, just before we go into the Dirty Dozen so that you can get focused, I also just want to give you another exercise. I want you to start thinking about, um, we'll probably come back to um, this later, but I want you to think about how can you make um, an incorrect selection of a red sauce, a bottle of tomato sauce? How does that actually happen? And um, thinking about this, and the next time you go into Coles or Woolworths and look in that aisle, I don't know if many of you have ever come home and picked up the wrong one. It, that may seem like something quite minor that you would do, picking up the wrong bottle of tomato sauce. I can tell you when my daughter was 12, if I picked the wrong bottle of tomato sauce, it was pretty major error that I would have made that day, particularly if we'd run out. Um, these days it's not quite so important, um, but all the same, if you just start to explore now all these sauce bottles on the left were all the sauce bottles that are in that aisle. You can see when they're lined up together, they differentiate quite clearly. When they're all um, bunched up together, you know, when they're all spread out there, then it's a bit more difficult and they all look so similar. So you can imagine how um, our brains can work and how easy it can actually be to make that incorrect selection. Now if I look at the six on the left and I go through them then it's going to be much more difficult especially if no one's distracting me. If I go into Coles and somebody also rings me and asks me to not forget um, strawberry yogurt, skimmed milk and also some um, comfort um, wash powder then I'm going to get distracted, I'm going to be even less likely to, to pick up the correct one. So I want you to think straight away when we start going in the dirty dozen and if we just go back to our dirty dozen straight away before we even explore them you can think about buying a sauce bottle, distraction, um, it could be lack of teamwork because they always make me go to pick the sauce, fatigue if you come in after work and you've not eaten all day, um, it could be pressure because I bought the wrong one too many times so I really don't want to make the same mistake. Um, lack of a certainness because I don't tell my family to buy their own sauce bottle. So lots of things already that you can see and that's just about buying a bottle of sauce. Um, you might think, I've just got a picture of a CTG now up on the screen and you would think, okay, when we look at things retrospectively, it's always really easy to see things um, differently. But when we're under pressure, it's so much harder for us to identify things. Um, and you know, just trying to reinforce why it's so important that we explore this. As you're all looking, um, you'll see on your screen and you'll think, okay, that looks really easy to see that we started a bit of CTG monitoring. I know it's not the best quality, but you can see at the beginning and then it goes and reverts and starts recording the maternal. I can tell you that this is, you know, this happens and people, I'm sure you're all nodding, you all know situations where that's temporarily happened and you've missed it happening. This one, when we're looking in retrospect, is quite easy to spot. It's even easier to spot because it's got the, um, it's got picking up the maternal as well, so you can see that it's mirroring that. But I can still tell you in this situation, the staff with everything else that was happening had a period of time that they did not recognize this. That's not because they're not trying to do their jobs effectively. That's not because they've not got the necessary knowledge, but sometimes you don't um, pick things up. Remember our pattern recognition um, is what we work on quickly and we're responding to. We need to take time to use the second part of our, so we've got two types, um, two parts to our thinking. We've got that type one, 
which is more immediate pattern recognition, that quicker way of thinking. And then the type two, where we're thinking a bit deeper, we're really analyzing what the problem is. So we're thinking, um, taking more time. That's where, when you're going through things um, methodically and literally, you know, having a look where you're going to work it through. When you're working fast and under pressure, and you just particularly just look at the second part, it'd be easy to start thinking that these were decelerations, um, if nothing else. And sometimes we don't take the time to look at everything. So it's just really easy how we can make all of us make those errors. Remember the pattern, so easy. So we're gonna go back to our data design now. I'm gonna go through some examples in clinical practice. And I'm gonna just talk through some of the examples that are in the fetal monitoring. What I want you to do is to just think about that they might apply to you, but also to start getting your mind thinking. So when you do your own sessions, that you can bring up what's important to you all in your areas of work. So the first one of our dirty dozen that we're going to look at is um, lack of communication. And, you know, as I said, that usually comes out um, as the most discussed um, one. It's usually also at the top of many contributing factors um, in um, events, in adverse events. What I want you to start to explore, and for those of you that have looked at the um, fetal heart rate monitorings, one of the things we're trying to really avoid is confirmation bias. And what I mean by that is we think we're communicating clearly, but we can also um, have a risk of trying to influence the person that we're passing the communication on to. And a key example of that is saying to somebody, this CG, this CTG looks normal, doesn't it? And now if you think about that, if somebody says that to you, and if I say, I say that to you looking really confident, this CTG looks normal, doesn't it? Very different to if I say, Mel, please can you come and have a look and review um, my CTG and review um, the full clinical picture for me. I'm not giving you any, um, you know, there's no bias in there. So I'm making it very open. I'm making it very clear what I want you to do. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that you can think about. The other thing that we can think about is we often think that we've given a message, but we don't, we're don't. we not always good at using that closed loop communication. So checking in to make sure the message has been um, received well. And that again is another area of real importance. Um, one of the human factors things that I was um, listening to, they talked about the closed loop communication. It was interesting. They were um, relating it to some home situations where we're much better at doing that. Often people will say, oh, the, you know, it feels a bit weird um, repeating everything that your colleagues said to you. Sometimes it's easier on the phone, but maybe in face to face to actually repeat what the instruction had been can sometimes seem a bit um, bizarre to us. Yeah, I know if I call my local restaurant to order a takeaway, I'm absolutely not going to be surprised when they repeat every single thing on my order back to me. And we don't think that's strange. So just something to think about there and to just get you reflecting. So don't ask people um, about, you know, the CTG and telling them that you think it's normal. Ask them what they think. Ask them, how is this fetus? So that you get um, that your communication across correctly, that they know that you're asking them to make a review of that situation. The next one we're going to think about is um, complacency. And when we talk about complacency, that can be really described as that feeling of um, self-satisfaction accompanied by a loss of awareness of potential dangers. So what happens is we can become overconfident and it's good that we develop confidence with things, but what we've got to do is to just take a step back sometimes and just check in with ourselves. Don't assume things are always the same. Um, you know, we can often truly believe that we're doing things correctly because we've always done them in that way. But what we need to do is to just check in, challenge assumptions of others, but also challenge assumptions within ourselves as well. And making sure that we're um, thinking about the whole um, picture when we're looking at things. Um, and not making those assumptions. Also not being complacent about colleagues that we're working with and making assumptions around, you know, how um, 
how their response will be on any one day. So just really thinking carefully and um, challenging ourselves. The lack of knowledge one um, can almost speak for itself, but I think particularly when we're thinking about interpreting CTGs, you know, it can be really challenging. And especially if the clinical picture is complex and it's okay to ask and to speak up, you know, it's really important. And if we have concerns, we always need to think about seeking that other opinion. It doesn't matter who we are. It goes back as well um, to, um, you know, being human and just recognizing that there may be other factors affecting that as well. It may be that there's been as well, you may have um, in all areas of maternity care, there could be just that it's, there's new evidence and we're doing things differently. So it is about trying to keep up to date with um, new guidelines, but sharing that in your teams and team huddles. So share with each other. So we've got that um, real sharing of knowledge, having that reflection on what's happening um, locally so that we're all on the same page. Um, distraction, we all know um, if we're distracted, um, how that affects us. If we're distracted in the middle of a task, then we actually need to go back a couple of steps um, to make sure, particularly if it's a task that we're doing um, where we're working on that more, um, working through something um, quite quickly, for example, um, you know, if we're working through and we're doing a drug, a drug checking situation, then we need to take a step back. We need to take a step back because you'll miss the last points. Um, we have to remember that maternity care is really complex as well. Um, we can also, things can be complicated, you know, we can be distracted if we're looking after more than one woman because our mind's distracted thinking between the two. Um, we've got to work out how we're going to do that and sometimes we need to, you know, we need to either think if we need to escalate that, if we're not able to do that, we need to be able to um, work with our colleagues as well. If we're doing complex tasks, then it's really important that we think about creating those circles of safety. So just giving that protection for that person while they're doing that complex task and then come back together um, as a team. The other thing with distraction is that you know if we're distracted by other things happening you know you're looking after a woman in second stage and you're really or you've been involved with it all day it can be very easy to be distracted from the whole situation it can be very easy to just lose sight of the whole picture and to not be able to fully maintain that full situational awareness and that's where your second person checks are so important in many ways, not just with um, your fetal heart rate monitoring, um, but with things generally. Having that second opinion is so important. Often people will say after events, um, you know, when they're reflecting on why things went wrong, that they just didn't see. They knew, they got the knowledge, it, there was no intention, but they just didn't notice at the time. Examples of that can be things like, um, monitoring um, maternal um, as fetal heart rate, monitoring twins and not realizing that you're monitoring both the same twin. Um, things that you think if you weren't distracted and that you had that fresh eyes that you're more likely to see. So that is the beauty and that's really where our second person checks come in. So they're really there, not anything to do with our knowledge or anything like that. They're there to help us identify something that we might have missed. And we might have missed it for other factors, not just because we don't have that knowledge, because we were distracted, because we are deeply involved with the, the woman we're caring for, because we're also looking after someone in the next room. So it's thinking about how we're going to put these um, things in place. Maybe it's stop the clock moments, stopping and just thinking about where are we at now, stopping with the team, having those fresh eyes um, body system um, type things, whatever will work for you. And really that mirrors nicely with the teamwork and the importance of good teamwork in this. Um, where it can sometimes um, be detrimental, particularly in, you know, so we might just not know our own team's strengths and weaknesses. Um, sometimes we can be in danger of working in silo as well and, you know, and not working we, you know, we can feel as though, you know, we're just getting on with our own work and that's, you know, can feel all okay. But it, when we do work in silo, then 
that can increase our susceptibility to errors and those of our colleagues around us. So just thinking about how we can do that. Also thinking about the well-being of our team around us, asking them, are they okay? Asking people just directly, are they okay today? Um, what's affecting them? Thinking about, you know, so having those effective handovers to find out what human factors might affect us all today. The fatigue one is a big one. And when we talk about fatigue, um, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, that that deep tiredness that's just more likely to lead us to errors. And every single one of us online today will have felt fatigue at some point. Now, I know we can't wave any magic wands and we do have to work through areas of fatigue. That's, you know, that's the um, that's part of what we do. But what we need to do is to acknowledge that when we're fatigued, we are more easily distracted and we're more likely to lose situational awareness. If our colleagues are fatigued, that's more likely to happen to them. So it is checking in with each other. It is acknowledging that. It is being honest with each other. And, um, you know, and remembering that calling for help, particularly in these sort of situation, is not about an inability to cope. It's not about incompetence. It's not about us not being able to do our job as well. It's an actual appropriate response to dealing with um, situations, you know, so dealing with that situation of fatigue. So we're just calling for somebody to help us out here. Um, and if somebody does um, ask us, then we need to um, check in um, and respond to them. Um, if you're a manager or you're a leader, it's really important that we, you know, we work in and, you know, getting our staff to take breaks um, and supporting others to take theirs as well. But that is a responsibility of all of us to do that for each other. Um, a lack of resources, um, searching for equipment, especially in an emergency, can be one of the most distracting things can be one of the things that really um, you know takes away our time and really um, pulls us away from work so it's so important that we've got that necessary equipment and safety huddles are a perfect time to think about that it's also good to sometimes check in and have that awareness we can work I'm sure you've all worked in areas where for you've made do with things and you've done workarounds so you've thought we don't have these resources, so we've done things um, in a different way. Um, but we need to be aware of that because this can lead to errors. Think about I ran out, you know, my gray, my cling film, my glad wrap um, ran out. I didn't have that resource, so I used something else. I used something else that wasn't really correct for the job, and it led to that error. Think about how that could be the same in your workplace if you're working around and not using the right things. Could that contribute to somebody else being susceptible to making an error? And, you know, escalate those um, to, your, to the rest of your team. See what you can do about that um, so that it's not just something that you start to accept. Um, pressure, big one, working in new situations. Um, you know, it could be that you're working somewhere different. We can, uh, it's just those feelings of really being overwhelmed um, and not in control. And they can come from either within us or external factors. So lots of things can make us feel pressured at any one time. And in those times, it's really important that we take just, you know, brief stop the clock moments with ourselves. We just, um, you know, just take a minute to just um, feel and just work out, do we need to ask for help? Do we, you know, do we feel that pressure? Or is it, um, you know, something that as a team we can work through acknowledging together? Remember, even things that work in new areas can put people under immense pressure. So you could be working with somebody who is, you know, highly experienced in what they do. So you could think they've had years of working on a birth suite. They come to another birth suite and believe me, you can suddenly forget your own name. Never mind, um, you know, doing the same task can just seem completely different. So again, it's just um, thinking about that. Lack of assertiveness then, so when we are thinking about it and we're highlighting it, um, we need to be able to speak up within our team and we need to be able to feel that we can share information and be listened to. So it's really important that we all um, work in our teams to develop that culture of speaking up for safety. And always, always, particularly when you're looking after, you know, often when we look at, 
um, incidents involving that are related to fetal safety, people will say that they felt something was wrong. So always follow your gut instincts and follow the gut instincts of those of your colleagues as well and speak up and escalate and escalate to that highest level because there's usually something um, underneath. And then stress. That in itself can feel really stressful. So I've already made you feel stressful by um, thinking about um, speaking up. So stress in itself can just, you know, really drain our energy levels, makes us feel more tired, and it just reduces our ability to concentrate. So that could be more of a chronic or it could be an acute. Um, so depending on that um, will be our responses. Um, particularly, you know, acute situations such as, you know, it could be an emergency situation like we've got a fetal heart down to 60, it's not recovering. Um, it is our natural response to feel stressed in that situation. We will all deal with that stress differently, but we'll all feel that to a degree. And the things that can help us all are having, using our checklists, using um, our processes carefully, and also just taking time in those stressful situations as a team to just stop the clock. You can do that for less than a minute and just um, think about what's happening in this situation. Because that as well will take you on to the next one, which is around um, awareness, so that we don't lose our awareness of the whole situation. Because as well, when we're stressed, that's going to reduce our alertness and we'll be distracted and we you know we may not well see the full clinical picture that's in front of us so we then start to miss other things um, all things contribute to that lack of awareness and you'll start to see straight away if you've got one of these dirty dozen you can bet that you've got um, a few of the others as well they usually go very much hand in hand um, so they're not <coughs> separate what you can do is though is feel where the strongest feel is and where you can target your strategies and often the strategies are simple anyway so how we can improve our awareness and maintain our situational awareness again is through those stop moments working as a team making sure we're not fixated on one task so we're thinking about what is happening around us this can be a common problem um, in second stage and we you know when we anticipate and there's a lot of things happening that we've got to keep on with um, and we can just um, lose that for that minute and the very last one of our dirty dozen is what we call norms and norms is um, otherwise known as normal for around here so it's just what has become normal practice in any um, given site so We'll have all worked to norms at some time, I am sure. So it's where you're working to that set of unwritten rules or beliefs. Um, but it, we've got to be really cautious because they can distract us from our safety standards. And recognizing that just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean that that is the best way for it to be now. We And also, when we rely on that, we're thinking of our pattern recognition and we may not see everything. So we need to use our analytical thinking. We need to challenge assumptions and think about what's happening. Um, you know, challenge things just because it was okay before doesn't mean to say it's okay today. That's not criticizing what happened last week or the, the month before, but think about, okay, is this right today? Is this the best way forward? Um, a few people have spoken to me about differences that they found in, um, for some people with intermittent auscultation, and that that's not how they've always done it. But that doesn't mean to say that that's not the best. You know, we have new knowledge and we put things together in different ways and look at better ways of doing things for the safety of um, women and babies all the time. And that's one of those examples. But it can be quite difficult to challenge those um, assumptions within the team. So we need to be really open and we need to be open that we can be on the reverse of that. So the most important thing is to be open to these sort of discussions, talking about these strategies and having that understanding of being um, human and so that we're really kind about it to each other. I think kindness is one of the key things that comes across in all of these strategies. So kind of summarizing there, if you want to avoid or mitigate errors, we have to notice them and we have to understand them. And only then can we think and plan ahead. So if I ever say to you this, 
can you sign my CTG, please? It's all normal, isn't it? So I don't want you to think, oh, well, that's Maria. She's working with me today, and she worked on the fetal safety education. You can't ever assume that. I'm totally relying. If I ask, I'm not going to ask you. I can promise you I'll not ask you the question in that way. I'll be asking you if you can come and provide a second opinion on a woman I'm looking after who's on a CTG. And I will ask you to tell me, how do you think this fetus is? What is it telling me? That will be my commitment. But I also expect that you'll not make any assumptions um, of my knowledge and things, that you'll think really carefully because I could be distracted. I could be fatigued. You know, I could just, it's just that there are so many things that could impact. And that's, you know, what I'm relying on. I'm asking you that because I'm looking for that support from my team colleagues. Um, we continue to make errors. This is another example, and I'll just tell you really briefly. Um, this is something outside of CTG. So I had a tree in my garden. I've lost so many more trees since then, actually. But this one tree had a branch that stuck out, and every time I mowed my lawn, I would walk into the tree and bang my head. And it was so painful, I can't tell you. And every time I'd set out, um, my husband would shout, don't walk into the tree. And I'm like, I know, I'm not going to walk in the tree. I don't want to walk in the tree. Of course I'm not going to walk in the tree. And I can tell you that once I start, I don't know about you, but when I set off with my mower and I'm walking up and down, I start thinking of other things. Or I'm even looking at if I'm walking in that line. And I will continually bang my head. I don't want to bang my head. I don't like the pain. The pain reminds me that it's not good. But unless I just give up mowing the lawn, I've got to do something um, more. So we chopped off the branch so it was completely gone. And sometimes you have to really review what you've put in place because it might also not work. I had to chop off. I've, even that, I started walking into that bit. So, so many more um, things have been tr trimmed down. You have to just work out what's going to work for you and what's going to work for your teams. So I want you to think about, you know, what could you implement and start testing out? When you do your face-to-face -face sessions, start thinking about, use that opportunity to talk with your teams then about, so that when you're considering, um, you know, you're working through your fetal heart, you're working through an intrapartum case, not only are you thinking about um, what's the full clinical picture and what the fetal heart rate, um, think about what else is going to impact as well. Um, so that you put it all together collectively. There are other resources on our CC um, webpage as well that can um, help you, and um, we'll just build on those um, as we move forward in time.